What is it about this game that gets people so excited about its stories, no matter how much time went by? With that question in mind, the Tibia Chronicles project was born. In cooperation with more than 25 of its frontline players, we will breathe new life into tales from the hidden corners of the internet as we place them side by side with the most famous of legends. This is the story of Antica. When most of us think of this game's history, there is old Tibia, and really old Tibia, the ugly one. The transition between these two clients took place in the summer of 2002, and it's easy to forget that by this time there were players that already called Tibia home for five years. The new client was a massive improvement made possible only by the revenue from premium accounts, which were introduced a year earlier and allowed the students to turn their hobby into a full-time job. The extensive updates made for an unforgettable gaming experience, and the game would explode in popularity over the upcoming years. After five years of trial and error, it seemed like Tibia had finally found a real vision. But of the chaotic road that lay behind are no more than a few screenshots left. Ironically, this period is said to be the most lively of the game, with some going as far as calling it the only real Tibia. To understand this ancient era, we turn our eyes to the less than 100 players that shaped a worldwide phenomenon for half a million souls that followed them. The Internet, the Information Highway, the New Electronic Frontier, the World Wide Web. These phrases and concepts have become a part of everyday language. Oh boy, has the world of online gaming changed over the past year with new games, new game zones, new technology that is really revolutionizing the world of computer gaming on the net. You'll be able to play with your friends or people you just meet at any time, 24 hours a day. While online gaming was gearing up to take over the world, a server of the Regensburg University facilitated the awakening of Tibia 1.0. As no more than a school project of three students, the game was basic to say it nicely, so you can imagine their excitement when players actually started dripping in, either from home or even internet cafes. It was a time of casual gameplay, in a server that was shared with no more than 10 to 20 players at the same time. Without a tutorial island, your level 1 spawns right into the only city of the only server in Tibia, conveniently named Tibia City. A quick look around reveals only a few buildings and even fewer creatures. In fact, the best you could get was the only ghoul in the game, which spawned once in three minutes, and you had to draw a number for it. There was no skull system to restrict kills, so anyone skipping the line learned the hard way that upon death, you lost all of your experience points, together with the entirety of your equipment. With the 4.0 beta update a year later, dying became only half as fatal. The char was so brittle in early Tibia that you didn't invest in it. It was a vehicle to explore the game. Only when the death penalty moved from 100% permakill to only losing 10% experience and skills, plus all equipment, that people seriously tried to conserve their character.
When you combine this death penalty with already troublesome dial-up internet applied on an even more unstable tibia server, a strong urge to reconsider your choice of entertainment might overwhelm you. Content is extremely limited. Bugs are rampant. And if we're honest, the graphics were already ugly in the 90s. Yet there must be something that keeps people playing, right? In the distance flicker the lights of the only tavern in town, persuading you to one more drink at Frodo's before logging off forever. But what you find there changed the lives of many. The place is stacked with the most delightful characters cheerfully toasting to their latest adventures. You've just met the original role players of Tibia. Something magical happened in Tibia. There were people that didn't just abandon the empty game, but instead saw a world of freedom and opportunity. With their background in tabletop fantasy games, it became only natural to fill in the blanks with their own fan fiction websites, and elaborate character background stories. Special personalities were interwoven with each of their characters, and regardless of the owner, a different character was a different person complete with its own traits and quirks. You could meet noblemen, adventurers, knights in shining armor, thieves, and vampires. The diversity was restricted by nothing but the player's imagination. For a large part of the early community, role-playing was a way of life, with some people hiding their identity even from their own friends. The playstyle gave rise to entire family trees composed of brothers, sisters, children, parents, and lovers. Some even went as far as logging their secret character off forever without leaving any contact information. The community didn't just limit themselves to stories, however. Armed with nothing more than household items, they took their efforts far into no man's land with picnic spots, training camps, and parcel castles. In the south, you might find Thorin Oakenshield running his famous Minobar serving the freshest burgers in all of Tibia, and the occasional Cyclops to go with it. If the players were not busy desecrating graves, favorite recreations included weddings complete with bachelor parties. By invite only, you could enjoy one of the many events, like a full-length stage play of Romeo and Juliet, courtesy of the Red Rose. There was also a choice selection of games, like the Tibia Ball League, where even the ball had to be improvised. For the pinnacle of Parcel Castles, however, the brave pilgrim traveled far north into no man's land, where he would stumble upon an entire parcel city. People had pushed furniture all the way from the other side of the map 
eager to take up their roles as blacksmiths and innkeepers. Given the social nature of the game, it was naturally only a matter of days before citizens grouped together and established the first guilds in Tibia. Since there was no client function to display guild information, a player's membership remained a mystery unless he told you directly. Guild business was typically reserved for internal members only, so their existence would have been lost to time, if not for a few archived websites that stand today as the only remnant of these ancient orders. The honor of the first guild in Tibia is claimed by the Order of the Spiritual Flame, way back in 1997. Its declaration is backed up by the official Tibia website, only to be contested by one other guild, Lost Boys, the Guards. Both were already considered inactive around 1998. If we take a closer look at the earliest guilds, something stands out. The number of guilds explicitly committed to the good is overwhelming. Sipsoft even introduced the logout block so that these guard guilds could punish troublemakers more effectively. It was a peaceful time, but whisperers from the shadows advocated for a balance in the world of role-playing. And soon enough, Organized evil officially found its way into Tibia. The Riders of the Apocalypse and Paladins of Darkness. Two names from 1999 that even the veterans seem to remember hardly anything about. Information is extremely limited and no screenshots of their legacy remain. They were supposed to be an evil response to all the good RPG guilds. All that survived of the Paladins of Darkness are fragments of stories from a day long ago. It's time for a change. Tibia has let a weed grow far too long. I challenge all noble Tibians to take up arms a time has come where, to prevent bloodshed, we must for a short while spill the blood of those whom have forfeited their rights to respect by violating the rights of many innocents. The Paladins of Darkness have not made a poor mistake. Nay, I say, they have established a pattern. lay our eyes on the website of the once proud Storm Knights. Once among the first to have their own guild hall constructed, they left behind nothing but the ruins in which the Riders of the Apocalypse turned their castle. It's interesting to see how a few familiar names started out in this guild. Take Claxton who would go on to become a major figure in the last Action Heroes War of 2003. Or Guido, future Sipsoft employee, who got kicked out of the guild for misbehavior. In the lead stood Betrayal, whose chaotic reputation proved worthy of a poem by one of their members, a young Ares War. As the legend goes, Betrayal went on a rampage, taking out the server majority of nine players and leaving the rest scared in depot. The Night of the Riders was dark but finite. At the level of 33, the mighty Betrayal was bested in a duel at the hands of Gorak. The Riders responded with three days of vengeful attacks but were ultimately pushed back into the shadows. By the year 2000, both the Riders and Paladins of Darkness are gone from the guild list. Their members scattered, and the lines between good and evil would never again be so clearly defined. The 
Battle of the Riders of the Apocalypse was an exceptional incident, most likely carried out in good role-playing sportsmanship. With the exception of occasional random PK, real conflict was rarely seen. The players were casual and didn't have much on their mind except for socializing. In its first years, the game was basically a chat room with graphics. A chat room with four lines of unscrollable text. The community at the time, for the most part, was a much nicer place than you'd find almost anywhere on the internet these days. There were also PKs and bad people lurking around, but mostly you found players who helped if you died, and I'm sure in some cases they were probably the same guys that just killed you five minutes ago. Most early players praised the old community as superior to anything we have today. While this is easy to pass off as nostalgia, there might actually be something to it if we indulge in some speculation. One thing that you have to keep in mind is that the internet was only just starting to become mainstream, and home computers weren't nearly as commonplace as they were probably five to ten years later. You didn't see too many kids with access to either one of those things, so the age of players was probably quite a bit higher, mostly in the range of college students. Then you have the fact that trolling and other typical toxic behavior was pretty rare because people hadn't quite grasped the anonymity factor of the internet. People were more likely to act online as they would in real life. There is another consideration. Video gaming was becoming a behemoth of an industry that shifted its focus from hardcore gamers to the far bigger casual audience. There is big money to be made, so any company looking to run an online game now has to compete with multi-million dollar investments on an overcrowded market. If you as a company lose even the slightest bit of interest from your player, he won't have to think twice about dropping your game for the next big thing. It's a difficult environment for a slow-paced game like Tibia to survive. Sipsoft adapted to the industry by gradually moving away from their unforgiving consequences, for better or worse. As with most online games today, their lack of punishment takes away any practical reason for the player to conduct himself respectfully. <laughs> Tibia has its roots in a time when it was more common to ask your customers for bigger investments. Your character was a product of multiple years in a merciless world. The way to endure it was cooperation. If you died and lost your stuff, you had to call a stronger player to retrieve your gear, just like you did after getting trapped for hours or days without a rope. Quests required trust and teamwork. No NPC sold runes, so you relied on rune sitters without a safe trade. If you wanted to skill, you relied on other players and the long periods of standing still in training camps led to introductions and conversations. Another factor for social behavior was how a lone wolf was simply more likely to be picked on than someone in a family or guild. So people naturally gravitated to safety in numbers. This distribution of power in groups made everyone cautious to use their main character for PK. Because if you got in trouble with the wrong people, you could end up on some major guild's hunting list, where you'd have the choice between paying yourself out or saying goodbye to your carefully crafted character. Not to mention that many of these guilds took pride in actively hunting troublemakers, Serving justice was often a stepping stone to promotion in guild ranks. And with just a handful of hunting spawns, you really couldn't avoid running into your enemies. In turn, factions did much rather rely on diplomacy instead of war. 
No one wants to lose their months of hard-earned equipment and experience over a noob that drags everyone into an expensive conflict. It's no coincidence that the first serious war would not take place until 2002. Death had real consequences, so avoiding conflict was in everyone's best interest. Guild politics as a whole would only become a serious part of the game roughly after the year 2000 when the reduced death penalty and new dungeons started to make hunting a desirable playstyle. Until then, the players enjoyed their chats and parcel castles, but as they eventually got destroyed without exception, it became clear the game was in need of lasting content. While the three gods had their hands full on the technical side of the client, it were the players themselves that tried their hands at sprites, lore, and even new locations. And so, in 1998, the player Lost Boy rose from the sea the first town after Theus, Fibula. It would become a social center for role players, as much as an essential hunting ground. Whispers about dragons lurking in its deeper dungeons stirred fear in even the bravest of hearts, for only the most powerful few ever returned from its depths. It was Ares War's favorite hunting spot, and it was here where he took his legendary screenshot. Yet long before he was anywhere on the high score list, Deeper Fibula was home to the one considered by many as the first power gamer of Tibia. In a time when most people still frowned upon serious hunting, Opa Vetavox spent his time alone with the dragons of Deeper Fibula, grinding his way to become the first level 50 in Tibia. In tradition with most power gamers after him, he is said to be friendly, but ultimately solitary. It's no surprise that no one knows for sure what made him disappear around the end of 1998, but the milestones he left behind in level and skills made sure it took the rest of the server no less than two years to catch up with him. With the creation of their own custom guild hall, the Red Rose settled themselves on Fibula for the next two decades. Although founded as one of many role-playing guilds in 1998, they would see RPG and traditional values all but disappear in the upcoming years. In the face of a changing world, the Red Rose held on to the traditions ever so firmly and dedicated themselves to preserving the original spirit of wonder in the game with elaborate events that put a smile on the face of every generation. Their mysterious presence and serious involvement in the early game made them a subject of the occasional rumor about favors from their fellow Germans at Sipsoft. It's not surprising. By 2002, an exceptional number of game masters decorated their ranks, together with some of the richest and most prestigious players you could find in Antica. If you knew trading, you knew Lightbringer. The crown, the magic longsword, and the blessed shield 
are only a few of the many examples that he turned to profit. In a time when the sight of a demon startled even the bravest adventurer, he was the first to complete the demon quest and return with all its riches. Ever since his retirement, Lightbringer has been untraceable, but the argument that he is one of the few to truly measure up to legendary status is ever so strong. The other red rose we highlight today is the Spanish power gamer Pepe Lu, who was found in the top five levels for many years. Often cited as a role model, he was trusted by complete strangers for his reputation alone. Players rejoiced at his appearance as a frequent host of weddings as well as a game master, before he fell for the temptation of blocking demons with his invincible charm. It was he who discovered the secret sheep level, and according to his friends, many quests alike. The Red Rose recently celebrated their 20th anniversary, making them the longest lasting guild in Tibia, and undoubtedly one of the oldest online gaming guilds in the world. The sheer amount of joy they have supplied all throughout these years makes it no exaggeration to place them among the most respected and consistent guilds in all Tibia. When the first guilds got their own guild halls and the first houses were built, it was Lost Boy who took up the job of landlord. Player homes were no more than regular buildings for which you were granted two actual keys. If you lost them, you lost your house. The few homes were always in high demand, but rarely did they get auctioned. They were sometimes given away as a reward for mini games. But most of the time, Lost Boy just broadcast a server-wide message whenever a house was free. First come, first served. Since there was no protection zone inside the home, it was the perfect place to train, as long as you didn't get shot through your window. The Red Rose Guild Hall shared the island with a personal tower for Opa Vetavox, a brand new bar, and a secret path to Lost Boy's private island. But Fibula was incomplete were it not for the towering fortress that overshadowed it all. Here was a home worthy of sheltering the mightiest warriors money can buy. The mercenaries took the game in a direction far beyond any of Sipsoft's plans when they laid claim on the entire island of Fibula. For a monthly tax, you hunted in an area protected by the most dedicated soldiers of Tibia. Their action was unprecedented in the game and undoubtedly influenced Sipsoft's future developments. For Antica, it would prove to be the starting point for an era of territorial claims. Some more effective than others, but none equal to their success. The Red Rose became protected residents and developed a close friendship over the years. For the rest of the world, the benefits of mercenary services were enough to earn widespread support. Of course, their claim did not pass entirely without resistance. Disputes about taxes with higher levels like Flamehead and Ares War became the order of the day. Even so, in the face of an exponentially growing community, the mercenaries remained untouchable as the largest and most powerful guild for five years, before standing their ground as a leading force in the two world wars that followed. Their main goal remained the same all throughout, making money. In a time when most players looked no further than casual recreation, they pioneered a radical new dimension to the gameplay, 
While their roots in role-playing and strict internal codex earned the respect of friends and foes alike, one of them being a young adventurer named Soy Madrid Pa. During one of his explorations, he stumbled upon the entrance to Fibula, where the only way forward was guarded by an intimidating knight. This was a mercenary on guard duty, often stationed to keep troublemakers out and allowing passage only to those who paid their taxes. Soy Madrid, like many low levels after him, was more than willing to pay. After his first adventure down the dungeons ended in death by the infamous demon skeleton, he was informed a patrolling merc had secured his loot. For anyone looking out of the tower the following day, Soy Madrid's gratitude was hard to miss. Little did he know about the road this innocent gesture would take him on. One of the leaders, Toy Roshak Akalabeth, was amused, enough to take Soy Madrid under her wing. Only after careful consideration did he decide to apply for membership. Because joining the Mercs is not like joining any other guild. And in his future position as leader and recruiter, Soy Madrid saw firsthand just how many people underestimated this. Some players simply wanted to join us for protection. Others wanted the power and still others just wanted to kill others without consequences. Of course, enemies always wanted to hide a spy in our members too. The truth is that you either had the mercs mentally or you didn't. And as a recruiter, I still remember how many people didn't believe me when I first told them how much they were going to work for the guild. As of today, the mercs forum counts over 1300 applications. The pool of potential recruits was always large, of which only a few made it through the trials, which included observations and tests by undercover characters. The strict application procedure boosted the guild's reputation with reverence, which was sometimes negatively viewed as elitist. The higher ranks insisted, however, that this was purely the result of practical reasons. Since any aspiring member was expected to put in the hours taking care of player killers, patrolling Fibula, and handling an ever-growing number of disputes. The private messages of higher-ups basically never stopped flowing whenever they logged in. They would be an important part of regular guild meetings governed by traditional greetings and customs. A mercenary could be approached for just about any job money could buy, so you would often spot them hosting quest services, running their shop, guarding an event, or organizing one themselves. There was no shortage of mercenaries eager to help out with these activities, as the guild worked with a system that rewarded activity both from the inside and outside with points that in turn could be used for discounts, private services, or promotions. One of the most dangerous but profitable ways to earn points was by taking up hits from the Black Book. A mercenary could be summoned at a moment's notice to deal with a black book entry, one of their most controversial achievements. It was the place where rule breakers were marked for death, and depending on the severity of their crime, targets would not see their name removed before dying anywhere between one and five times. The word hunted has lost much of its impact in the later days of Tibia. But if you keep in mind the early brutal death penalty, combined with the absence of any kind of skull system, you might see why being black booked posed a very real problem, especially for the lower levels. It was not long before every self-respecting guild had a black book, but the mercenaries stayed the only ones you could approach with a generous sack of gold for a bounty on a head of your choice. So long as it wasn't a guild ally, the target could be anyone and would still be killed even if he offered double the money to spare his life. Unsurprisingly, those at the receiving end of this policy cursed the mercs and their self-imposed license to kill, earning them the title of the most hated guild in Tibia. 
For some, it was enough to side against them in the World Wars, with the full intention to spill blood. Until then, the Mercs proudly stood watch over those on their good side, always prepared to risk their lives for a brother in arms. A thick skin was a precondition for anyone who dared to join, as daily threats and insults were the price you paid for policing the world. There is one more fibula story that stands out. We've all seen the proud ship docked in Greenshore, where players lined up for hours to get a glimpse of Tibia's rarest items during the legendary Tibianic Expositions. It was the custom-made guild hall of the Alliance of Free Tibians. But years before the ship was added, the guild found itself struggling with inactivity in 1999. What they needed was a group project, and thus, inspired by the parcel city of Greenwood, the dedicated members hauled 100 parcels to the western shore of Fibula, making it the docking station of the very first Tibiani. After the prototype got destroyed, the ship was rebuilt even bigger in Carlin, but not before the mercenaries indulged the Alliance of Free Tibians as honorary Fibula residents, free of tax. At the gate of the ship, one could find the AFT guards, stationed around the clock, scaring off troublemakers and lowering the parcel bridge for members. You might not have guessed it, but you're looking at Tibia's first bot characters. Tagor, leader of the AFT, had them move parcels upon voice commands and programmed a response whenever someone greeted them. Tagor's computer science studies gave him an edge when it came to programming, which shows in his implementation of the first Tibia recording software, giving us some of the only moving images we have of the early days. Among the things he built was a map, which shows the exact coordinates of the player being exeveyed. Whenever someone made a global broadcast, his exact location was always transmitted to the client, so that the message appeared on the right direction of the screen. The same goes for Exiva. So, we created the tool to show these coordinates on a live map. Only a few people had access to it, but it was a powerful tool to hunt people or find their secret training spots. I nearly lost my position as GM when Guido found out about it, but in my defense I had already reported the client leak to CIP. I might have forgotten to tell them, we already had a tool. This useful tool nearly cost him his position as Game Master, but it's only one of the many impressive examples of the links people went to manipulate the game. Early on, exploiting the game wasn't considered a rule violation because the game was so new and CIP really didn't have any rules in place. It was more of a learn-as-you-go kind of mentality for them at the time. It wasn't really until later that they really cared much about any of the rules. I mean, language and racial comments and things like that would get you banned, but you never really heard deletions until it became a profitable enterprise. While the students at SIP tried to keep up with patches, Last beginning for Lekkers! The early Tibia players enjoyed the extremely exploitable game to its fullest extent. The amount of creatures a mage could summon used to be unlimited. Part of the repertoire included dragons, 
which at this point were still powerful enough to demolish 90% of the players. Unsurprisingly, the function was removed when player Bear set 20 of them loose on the streets of Theus. But not before these guys packed an entire room near Mintwallen while they waited for their unsuspecting victim to log back in. The kill succeeded, at the cost of crashing the entire server. Who was their target? Sipsoft employee Guido. There were certain players that knew how to keep giant spiders out of reach with their own summons. Much like this Theus demon could be stalled with mere parcels and poison fields. In the Plains of Havoc, it became a practice to lure as many giant spiders as one could find down the same hole, turning it into an instant death trap sprinkled with bait for the curious noob. Pushing a monster back and forth fast enough stopped it from attacking. And of course, Tibia wouldn't be Tibia if this technique was not quickly weaponized against fellow players. Anyone getting fast dragged lasted no more than a few seconds since the movement made it impossible for healing runes to land. Low levels at the ghoul spawn were occasionally paid a visit by the local demon pushed down the stairs. It happened to Taghor in his new beers who found himself cornered and decided to strike back from the roof. If summoned, Minotaur archers couldn't reach their target. A bug triggered their arrows to fire at a speed impossible to survive. This was possible because creatures and players were technically not limited by any delay in runes. This was normally compensated by the fact that players had to aim manually but it soon became the next function to be weaponized by the traumatic phenomenon known as Macro PK. Set up a simple script to right-click the first slot in your backpack and left-click it on the square of your choice. Loop this action as fast as possible and your level 14 char is ready to demolish the top level with 18 runes per second. It was a time when spells could be unlocked by scrolls scattered across the map, regardless of your vocation. <laughs> Boom, baby. He can summon, guys. He can summon a monster. He takes him grand slot. Harry's War's noob char, spirit guide was among the distributors the most infamous of all. The energy bomb covered nearly the entire screen, making it impossible for low levels to reach the other side alive. However annoying that may sound, any shenanigans paled in the face of the invisible enemy. Connection issues. the client could handle no more than approximately 250 characters on screen before its performance was affected. Players rejoiced in yet another way to make life difficult, and throwaway characters were created who spammed targets to disconnect, sometimes taking the entire server with them by global broadcasts. Between Tibia and Utter Chaos stood the wizards. With barely any formal rules in place, it was up to these volunteers to decide when someone had to be banned for destructive behavior. To do so, they had to risk their lives on normal characters with nothing but a simple ban and teleport command. Only after their upgrade to actual game masters were they granted invincibility along with a never-sleeping help channel using the old four lines of unscrollable text. The community was so small that you probably knew someone personally among the first Game Masters. It was great to have a familiar face take care of problems, but using active players as admins has always remained a double-edged sword. From accusations of unfair deletions to speedrunning quests on invincible characters, corruption was here to stay. I know I personally got banned at least once for no reason. So I had the game masters that I knew unban me. Then I got rebanned and unbanned several times before they left me alone. 
I also knew a GM who would find AFK trainers in blocked areas. He would teleport his low-level character to the location and kill them for their loot. Only to ban them afterwards. As bad as that sounds, it was actually pretty fun being able to hang out with people with that kind of power. Because, you know, after all, the Game Masters were just people. Are the continuing implementation of new features without an overall concept? The data on the server and therefore also the server loot have gone immensely large without the single parts still fitting together properly. By 1999, the once legendary golden helmets had become no more than trinkets sold along with a magic plate armor for just 300 gold. By leaving loot rates unchecked for too long, the game had slowly shifted into complete imbalance. It was with the 5.0 beta update that SIP decided upon a drastic measure. Every golden helmet, e-plate, and fire sword in the game was reduced to junk. And the reset teleported the entire server back to the temple. Upset players scattered in chaos, but among them a mighty sorcerer decided upon swift action. Were there any rare items left at all? Within 10 minutes of the reset, she was down at the only place known to provide the answer. And there in the demon room, the items shined bright as ever. In slight disappointment over the lack of effort, she took her reward back to town unaware that this mighty treasure would never spawn again. At least, that's been the story for the past 20 years. It only fails to mention how this room was never accessible. Sipsoft had a habit of steering the imagination by dressing up unreachable treasure chambers, and the demon room was no exception. According to multiple veterans, Galadriel attempted to bug herself to the other side of the treasure room by what was known as wall walking. It worked, but once inside, death was the only way out, leaving your dropped items behind. To secure the items, she either waited days for another bug fix to teleport back to the temple, and more likely, assistance arrived from powers beyond. In any way, Galadriel secretly became the only owner of a rare set. Her progress was swift and her future bright, until fate took a drastic turn. At the crossroads of Theus, Galadriel was swiftly assassinated. The only rare set in the game dropped together with the mighty sorcerer in one clean hit. The ice rapier dissolved, and over the body towered Villock's batch. If he had any knowledge about the lucky catch he was about to make remains a mystery. We only know he was quick to drive the loot into the hands of a very special group. A group determined on profit by any means necessary, as we'll soon see. Before the 7.0 client in 2002, strangers had no choice but to exchange items without the security of a safe trade system. It's plain to see how this could turn into a disaster for either of the parties. So it was common practice, especially with high value items, to seek out one of the few trusted traders in the server, who in turn made a nice side business from their commissions. The early Tibia economy had very little competition, as most players were broke. People would come to me looking to sell their items, which I would buy for cheap and resell. I would yell my offers while waiting at the depot or at X-Roads in Theus. It was much easier to get your desired price, as no one could check for a lower price. People paid more for a sale with someone they trusted, 
as gambling on an untrusted merchant could backfire as there was no safe trade or market system to ensure the safety of your trade. It's among these traders that we find an exceptionally notorious name. Long before he earned a place in the lore with his legendary theft of the magic longsword, Alex took years to establish himself as a reputable merchant who players eagerly trusted to middleman their trades. All while his main character, Josephine, worked her way into the early council of the mercenaries. I managed to hide being a male in real life so well that Hellraiser was proposing in-game marriage like two days before a real life meetup. Only to be utterly disappointed when we met. With the increased demands for rares, Josephine opened Tibia Shop, the first website where players could purchase in-game items for real money, which during its peak earned him enough to substantially support his real-life income. According to his own words, his Swords of Valor would sell for anything between 70 and 700 euros. But his most lucrative deal would become the one and only Blessed Shield, until this very day, it's been a mystery what happened to the only Blessed Shield in Tibia after Lightbringer bought it from Musli in 2001. But now one more step of its journey has been illuminated. It turns out that a Red Rose by the name of Raphos inquired with Alex about the availability of the shield in October 2003. Alex inquired with the current owner, Lightbringer, who returned with the price of 3,000 euros. Alex forwarded the offer and the customer happily agreed after a modest commission of 500 euros was added to the price. Tibia shop became a business landmark, but to reach the success it did might have been impossible, were it not for the day when the smartest man he ever met took Alex aside. Player Winil decided it was time to introduce him to the underworld of duping. In short, duping was an exploit of server crashes resulting in duplicates of the items involved. It's estimated to be practiced between 99 and 2000, and it would secretly manifest itself once more in 2002, where it collapsed the entire economy, forcing Sipsoft to set back their servers a month. Dupers went great lengths to keep their profile low, as it was demonstrated more than once that deletion awaited anyone carelessly enough to get caught. Duping exploited the two separate ways Tibia backed up their game. The map state was backed up every morning at 10 a.m., separately from your character. Alex and Winnell would have their noob char drop a bag of items on the floor a few minutes before the server save. After the server save, they logged back in to pick up the bag, which was now saved in the map of that day. If the server crashed that day, it reset back to that morning. All you had to do was pick up the profit. Dupable items were restricted only by the capacity of their level 8s. The efforts of Alex and Winnell started with one character and a few plate armors and runes. But as the game developed, so did the duping techniques. When the waiting time between server crashes became a matter of weeks or even months, the duo didn't want to miss out and programmed an army of 10 macros that automatically logged in for the job every day. They duped rare items to keep the shop stocked and learned to specialize in diamonds, which turned out to have the best value for their weight at NPCs. 
For most players, a crash seemed like nothing more than an unfortunate coincidence. The active dupers, however, had no doubt they merely moved in the shadow of someone's well-calculated effort. By 1999, a city of great technological advancement had brought forth a small handful of players to the overwhelmingly German server. Most Hong Kong households had already employed cable internet years ahead of the other countries, and widespread magazines were part of the booming PC culture. It provided the adventurous few with an introduction to Tibia. Among them were the power gamers, Bubble and her real-life husband, Nietzsche. The typical Hong Kong player kept to himself with an air of mystique that intrigued the other Tibians. Not only were they notorious player killers, it was known they had perfected the dark art of duping. You see, the Hong Kong dupers didn't just wait for random server crashes, but planned them by the minute at the hand of targeted DDoS attacks. Infrequently enough not to draw suspicion from the Sipsoft students. Among their dupes were backpacks full of ice rapiers, which they sold and employed to bring back more loot into the cycle. It was probably one of these rapiers that Villex Batch used to bring them the only rare set in the game. Before Sip was able to put an end to duping, the damage was done. Within days after the Great Wipe, the players had already taken a run with the intended balance. All the Golden Helmets and Tibia can be traced back to this incident. It was proven once again that it was impossible to predict where the players would take Tibia next. Yeah. 